Uh, so today we're talking about global strategies using the AAA framework uh, to kind of introduce where we're going with this. Um, first, we had the adding value framework uh, in this module to understand why global corporate scope can create value. Uh, thinking about things like increasing volumes, uh, decreasing costs, differentiating, generating knowledge. Um, the CAGE framework helped us to better understand the challenges of um, internationalizing and more specifically, uh, it helped to understand which countries might make the most sense to internationalize to first. Uh, so thinking about countries that are proximate on the uh, cultural, administrative, geographic, or economic dimensions, and uh, specifically how some of those might be more important for some industries than others. Uh, today we're talking about uh, generic strategies for global corporate strategy. Um, you may not remember uh, the term generic strategies, but examples of uh, generic strategies in business strategy are differentiating and cost leadership. Uh, so these are sort of the equivalents of those for uh, global corporate strategy, and we'll be talking more about that today. Uh, so global strategies, again, these are the generic strategies for uh, global corporate strategy. Uh, we'll be talking about aggregation, adaptation, and arbitrage. Uh, so that brings us to these AAA strategies. Uh, the biggest tension uh, between these strategies is between adaptation and aggregation. Uh, the author of this, Pankaj Gemawat, calls that the adaptation aggregation trade-off. Uh, at the two extremes, you have adaptation, which is all about local responsiveness, uh, essentially adapting your product for the local uh, country market. And the purpose of that is to increase willingness to pay by uh, modifying your product or service or your policies or pricing or strategy to better suit uh, the market in each country. Um, a common mistake uh, with adaptation is thinking of any adaptation that the company is doing. Uh, so just because you're um, creating products for uh, different market segments, if you have some vertical uh, differentiation, for example, um, or if you change your product over time, making it better and better, uh, all of those things are adaptations. Uh, but this adaptation strategy is specifically about global corporate scope and modifying your products to be more valuable in specific markets um, in the global market, in the global economy. Uh, so that's one side of that. Uh, the other extreme, you have aggregation, which is all about economies of scale. Uh, so aggregation is... Um, the opposite of adaptation, rather than modifying products or policies or strategies for different markets, uh, you keep them as consistent as possible. And the goal there is to maximize economies of scale. Uh, so if you can uh, use consistent manufacturing for every market, then um, first you're not incurring the cost of doing the adaptation itself, uh, but you also may be able to achieve greater economies of scale. Uh, if we think about Grolsch, um, our previous case discussion, um, that would probably be an example of extreme aggregation. Uh, they did have some different products that uh, they sold more of in some countries than others, uh, but for the most part, uh, or basically they did not adapt their products at all for any particular markets. Uh, so they maybe sold different mixes in different places, but um, they really focused on uh, economies of scale and producing the same recipe, the same formula for worldwide distribution. Um, that may be an example of over standardization. Uh, maybe they could have made a little more money with a little bit more adaptation, uh, but that would be an example of the, an aggregation strategy. Uh, so uh, I'll visually show this in a couple of slides, but you can think of adaptation as replicating parts of your value chain uh, and different markets so that you're better suited for those markets and can increase willingness to pay. And you can think of aggregation as uh, the opposite of that. So rather than replicating parts of your value chain, you concentrate parts of your value chain into a single country uh, to achieve economies of scale. The third dimension of this triangle is 
uh, the globalization of production and specifically the arbitrage strategy, which is about achieving absolute economies. Um, if you think of uh, equivalence to the generic strategies for business strategy, uh, adaptation would be the differentiation strategy. Uh, you're increasing willingness to pay, uh, hopefully more than any increase in cost. Aggregation would be the cost to leadership strategy. Uh, you're focusing on lowering your cost through economies of scale. And uh, the hope is that you lower the costs more than any uh, associated decrease in willingness to pay. With arbitrage, uh, you can actually have either of those taking place. Uh, so you may be engaging in labor arbitrage to find uh, low cost uh, areas in the world where you can locate specific functions in your value chain. Uh, so it might be back office functions or it might be manufacturing. Uh, but when you find some place that you can do that uh, more cost effectively, uh, that would be uh, arbitrage for cost savings. Uh, you can also use arbitrage for increasing willingness to pay. A common example of that uh, is cultural arbitrage, where you have country of origin effects. Uh, so if you're creating luxury goods, often customers want to see uh, that they were produced in uh, high wage markets. So if you're producing uh, jeans, for example, if you make them in the United States, uh, customers might be willing to pay more for that. Uh, if you make them in Western Europe, um, the UK, France, Italy, customers might be willing to pay more for that. Uh, I'll get to this in a little bit more detail on a later slide. Um, but again, this is about absolute economies. Either Essentially, you're trying to maximize the gap between willingness to pay and cost at every stage of the value chain. Uh, so again, uh, these are some distinctions in how to think about these three different strategies. Uh, again, adaptation is about local relevance. Aggregation is achieving uh, economies of scale and scope. And arbitrage is absolute economies. Uh, arbitrage is almost always in the context of vertical relationships. Uh, so thinking about your value chain and uh, dividing that across uh, different uh, countries. That includes crossing organizational boundaries. Uh, so if you're having your manufacturing done in China uh, and you're doing that for cost savings, that is taking advantage of arbitrage, whether or not you're producing in your own factories there or if you're hiring another uh, specialized manufacturer to do that. Uh, so Apple, for example, hires Foxconn uh, to manage a lot of their manufacturing. Uh, that's a company that has a lot of expertise and can do high quality manufacturing of high, of high tech goods at lower cost than Apple could do that. Uh, so because they're crossing uh, geographic boundaries to accomplish that, that is arbitrage, even though it's not Apple owning that part of the value chain. Uh, thinking about CAGE um, and the CAGE framework in the context of this, uh, CAGE distance is really important uh, and minimizing CAGE distance is really important for adaptation and aggregation. Uh, essentially that reduces the trade-off between the two. Uh, so if you sell to a country that's very similar to your own country, that reduces the need for adaptation. And the more similar it is, um, if you do need to uh, do adaptation, the cost of that adaptation is lower. Uh, so if you're only selling into one or two other countries and they're very similar, uh, you can get a lot of those benefits of aggregation and minimal cost of adaptation. Uh, the more global you go, the more difficult that becomes. Uh, arbitrage is a bit of uh, the other extreme. So rather than minimizing cage distance, you're trying to identify uh, gaps that would allow you to uh, essentially exploit those differences. Uh, so if there's a region that has uh, can create high willingness to pay through their special production techniques um, or their high skilled labor or things like that, uh, that's exploiting distance to increase willingness to pay. Uh, if there's somewhere that your production can be done at a lower cost without reducing willingness to pay too much, Again, that's exploiting elements of distance. Uh, for common mistakes with all, each of these, uh, for the first two, adaptation, the risk is excess variety or complexity. 
So not all adaptations are going to increase willingness to pay more than the cost of uh, creating those adaptations. Uh, so that is a very common risk. Uh, with aggregation, this may be an even more common mistake, uh, relying on excessive standardization or emphasis on scale. Uh, this was not in your assigned reading, but in the uh, Redefining Global Strategy uh, book, uh, Pankaj actually talks about Walmart as an example of that. Uh, this was about 15 years ago, so it may not be true anymore. Uh, but one of the reasons that their uh, profits and revenues and margins dropped off so much with geographic distance was that they were doing very little adaptation of their offerings at that time. Uh, the author even gives the example of Walmart selling American style footballs in Brazil. Uh, so they were selling some uh, products that probably very few customers in, in Brazil were interested in buying. Uh, so they were doing very little adaptation, uh, excessive standardization, and that does not always create value either. Uh, with arbitrage, just like with financial arbitrage, uh, spreads can be competed away over time. Uh, and another example of that that's provided in the book is uh, with high quality IT outsourcing to India. Uh, at one point, IBM was really struggling because their competitors were uh, able to access this high talent or high skilled labor pool. And um, they were being able to accomplish IT tasks at a much lower cost than IBM. So IBM uh, shifted some of their talent pool and um, developed some operations in India. And that had two effects. Uh, one, they were able to take advantage of this high skilled labor at a lower cost, but also by moving there, they increased the demand for that talent and increased uh, the wages for those workers, which reduced the relative advantage of their competitors uh, who had to start paying their employees more as well. Uh, so that's an example of arbitrage opportunities being competed away. Uh, these next three slides are visual uh, illustrations of each of these strategies. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, adaptation is replicating parts of your value chain in different countries. Uh, you can see that uh, comparing the left to the right, uh, this exists in a continuum. Uh, so you could have more replication in each geography or less replication in each geography. Uh, so there's uh, the two structures on the right are engaging in less adaptation than the two on the left. Uh, again, you don't need to remember these names, uh, completely ignore international sales division, transnational, uh, that doesn't matter at all. Uh, what I want you to take away is uh, that adaptation is the replication of more or less of your value chain. Um, I have a note here that uh, this adaptation could happen at a regional level. Uh, which is another way to try to balance adaptation and aggregation. Uh, so if you're selling into Western Europe and uh, tastes and preferences are consistent for your product across that region, uh, you can do adaptation at the regional level in order to get more economies of scale and less uh, cost of adaptation. Um, so that's another possibility beyond just adapting to each country. Uh, next, we have aggregation. Uh, this is the opposite of that uh, adaptation. Uh, so the aggregation, again, is not replicating uh, parts of your value chain. Instead, you're concentrating parts of your value chain. Uh, so all of these are examples of that. Uh, this is kind of the flip side, then, of the adaptation. Uh, so on the left, uh, you had more adaptation, but then you have less aggregation. On the right, you have less adaptation and more aggregation. Uh, so each part of the value chain is concentrated in a single country. Um, and that's independent of how finally that's uh, divided up. Arbitrage is uh, rather than thinking about what's replicated and what's concentrated, it's thinking about how finely uh, you divide up your value chain and locate uh, parts of the value chain in different countries based on uh, specialization, so either increasing willingness to pay, lowering costs, or perhaps both. Uh, so comparing this uh, top to bottom, um, well, the entire left side does not have any arbitrage at all. On the right side, you could have some arbitrage. Uh, so this might be um, having 
your R and D and design and everything else located in one country and manufacturing in another country. Uh, you could also do that much more finely. Uh, so you might have some back office functions in one country, others in another country, R and D split over several countries. Uh, so uh, that's examples of arbitrage, uh, dividing that value chain more finely. Uh, so before I go on, uh, I'll mention that I'm going to go into some more complexity and more detail on some of these strategies in the next few slides. Uh, but what I've covered so far is the most important takeaways for these three strategies. Uh, so for adaptation, uh, an, an important thing to keep in mind is that there are different uh, levers and sub-levers for adaptation. Uh, so when you're thinking about the adaptation itself. Uh, the most obvious example is modifying your product or service for different markets, but you can also vary other aspects of your strategy. Uh, so for example, you might have varying policies around uh, pricing and discounting. Uh, maybe you offer credit for customers in some markets and not others. Um, there's a lot of things that you might vary from country to country. Uh, maybe you do more online marketing in one country and television marketing in another. Uh, so these are all things that can be adaptations uh, beyond the uh, product itself. Uh, repositioning is talking about actually having different strategies in different markets. Um, an example that was given of this in the book uh, was Coca-Cola. So originally when they started selling into India, they kept uh, pricing consistent with the rest of the world. So that caused them to be at a different competitive position in India than elsewhere. Uh, so they had high margins, but were serving only about the top 1% of the market uh, because they were selling Coke at a relatively high price for that market. Uh, that's, that's called skimming, uh, when you just take the top of the market um, in a lower income country. Uh, at some point, Coca-Cola decided to uh, reposition in that market, and they dramatically lowered prices and went for much more of a low-margin, high-volume strategy in India, which meant having lower prices there than in other countries around the world. Uh, so that's an example of thinking about how your competitive position, even for an identical product, uh, could vary uh, from country to country. Uh, in terms of reducing the need for variation, uh, I already mentioned the cage uh, distance framework being relevant here. So if you uh, expand into very similar countries, then there's less need for adaptation uh, and the cost may also be lower. Uh, you can also focus on specific products that reduce the need for variation. Uh, so if you are familiar with the enterprise software market, there are a lot of CRM providers out there. Uh, CRM is customer relationship management software. Um, there are tons of uh, cloud CRM companies that compete worldwide. And part of the reason for that is uh, very little adaptation of the product is needed uh, from country to country. Uh, you have also have other enterprise software companies that uh, focus on products that need much, much more adaptation. Uh, so Oracle and SAP, for example, will also have HR software and accounting software and things like that, which um, have very specific country requirements based on laws about hiring or laws about how accounting is done or how taxes are paid and things like that. Uh, so uh, you have more co competition in that CRM space because less adaptation is required. Uh, that's one strategy. Uh, if you're willing to incur the cost of that adaptation, you can sell more products and perhaps have higher margin, uh, but those are different strategies you might pursue. Uh, in terms of externalization, uh, a couple of the key points here are strategic alliances or franchising. Uh, essentially, if it would be expensive for you to adapt your products to different markets, uh, instead you can rely on local partners to do a lot of that adaptation for you. Uh, so you can license your products or brands to them or sell to local partners and then they resell and they can figure out the best pricing and strategy or if the product needs to be tweaked a little bit. Uh, so that's reducing the burden. Uh, design, uh, there's a lot of things that can be used for this. Uh, essentially, you're thinking about how to uh, 
design your products so that the parts that need to be adapted for each market are separate from those that do not need to be adapted. Uh, so that's partitioning and platforms and modularity. Uh, an example of that is uh, you often see with computers, the uh, power adapter and plug is separate from the rest of the computer. And that means that the core computer can be identical in every country you sell it to. And all that you need to change is the power adapter and plug. Uh, and that's a separate thing that just plugs into the computer. Uh, so that's an example of modularity that reduces the cost of variation. Um, in other devices, you don't see that. Uh, so like washing machines uh, tend to have all of that power uh, conversion within the device. Uh, so a washing mach machine that you sell in the US uh, would probably not work in the UK without some uh, more complex uh, ways of converting power and the plug and so on. Finally, uh, improving the effectiveness of variation. Uh, there's four different strategies here. Uh, transfer is taking adaptations from one place and applying them to another similar location. Uh, so if you're a US-based company and adapt your product to sell into Costa Rica, for example, um, that's a country that I've worked in, um, you need to do quite a bit of adaptation for that. If you go to a neighboring country, uh, say you're going into Nicaragua next, rather than starting from scratch and adapting your US product for Nicaragua, instead you can start with what you've done in Costa Rica and bring that, uh, those adaptations into Nicaragua and uh, dramatically reduce the need to refigure out from scratch uh, everything that's necessary. Uh, you might still do a few tweaks, uh, but it's going to be a lot easier than uh, starting from scratch. Uh, localization is uh, essentially delegating the ability to adapt products to the local level. Uh, so Procter & Gamble does a lot of this where they have teams in different markets that can modify their products and identify new opportunities. Uh, so uh, when they modify Tide to work with cold water, for example, uh, that would be an example of uh, allowing local adaptations um, based on uh, employees being closer to the customers and knowing what's needed. Uh, re recombination is uh, sort of the opposite of adaptation. Uh, rather than adapting, you're literally creating a new product from scratch in local markets. Uh, that's a much more extreme version. Um, so uh, obviously there's a lot of cost of doing that, but sometimes you can create new products that have value elsewhere uh, based on what you've done there. Uh, finally, transformation is rather than trying to adapt your offering, you try to modify local tastes and preferences to better suit what you're selling. Uh, Starbucks is an example of a company that does this. Uh, they, I think they'd probably do have some variation from country to country, uh, but they try to minimize that and create a uh, consistent experience worldwide. And rather than modifying their product completely, they try to uh, change local tastes and preferences uh, to be viable without those changes. I already mentioned some of these. Uh, arbitrage can interact with the cage dimensions. Uh, so again, rather than minimizing cage distance, you're taking advantage of differences on these dimensions. Um, you can have cultural arbitrage with favor favorable country effects. Uh, administrative arbitrage uh, can be kind of sketchy. Companies try not to talk about that too much. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out about administrative arbitrage is that it's usually legal but not always ethical, um, especially in the past, but probably still some countries have, or some companies rather have located production in countries with lower labor standards or lower environmental standards. And uh, they've used that to lower their costs of production. Um, that's probably not good for the world. Uh, arguably, it might not even be good for the company in the long term, because sometimes that comes back with uh, lawsuits and changing regulations later. Uh, but even if it is legal, um, I hope that you will try to do the right things if you're ever in the position to make these decisions. Uh, in terms of geographic arbitrage, essentially, again, that's just slicing the value chain more finely across geographies. And economic arbitrage, I mentioned previously that this can include finding low-cost places to do things, uh, but it can also be locating 
in a higher cost area that has specialized skills. So a lot of companies have offices in Silicon Valley, even if they're not headquartered there. And they do that in order to access, access specialized knowledge and specialized uh, pools of labor that can create a lot of value. Uh, so they're definitely not building offices there to be cheap, um, but that's still an example of economic arbitrage. Uh, the arbitrage can also interact with the added value scorecard. Uh, again, uh, you can use, the, use this to increase volume. Uh, so if you source fruit from around the world, and that might allow you to sell apples year round, for example, uh, you can use it to decrease costs or uh, increase willingness to pay. Uh, an important thing to remember there is that the goal is to increase willingness to pay more than your increase in costs, or if you're focusing on decreasing costs, to do that more than your lowering willingness to pay. Uh, but it's important to remember that activities for either are, is going to affect the other as well. Uh, so if you are uh, increasing willingness to pay by producing in the US or uh, France or Italy or the UK, for example, uh, that's going to also increase costs. Similarly, if you try to produce in a low cost country, that may decrease willingness to pay. So you need to take both into account uh, when you're making any of those decisions. Uh, one last thing I want to point out before we get into the case study uh, in terms of generating knowledge, uh, this is a mistake I've seen um, in my own work experience. Uh, when I was working at Oracle, we set up a lot of shared services around the world, uh, in Romania, the Philippines, and Costa Rica, uh, which is where I worked. Um, a big risk of this is splitting up the talent pipeline. Uh, so uh, when we set up operations in Costa Rica, uh, one of the things that we were doing was having uh, workers in Costa Rica write simple software license agreements and uh, working on simple negotiations over those deals. And in the US, we had uh, workers that were focusing on more complex negotiations and uh, larger dollar value deals, but that created problems on both sides. Uh, so in the US, where that all of that work used to be done, uh, by not having people start off with simpler work, it made it much uh, more difficult to develop uh, talent internally. Uh, because a lot of times people got good at the complex negotiations by starting on smaller and uh, simpler deals. Uh, so it kind of cut off the talent pipeline in the US. Um, similarly in Costa Rica, uh, because they were splitting this function by complexity, you were uh, training a lot of people who got better and better at understanding contract negotiation. But because uh, of the way the work had been divided, their growth opportunities in Costa Rica were limited, and uh, that's always demotivating and makes it hard to keep some of your best employees. So when you do split tasks between countries like that, um, it's really important to think about what that's going to do for uh, developing talent for the future, uh, because that can have serious implications on your business that are easy to not think about in advance.